Welcome to Ear Biscuits, I'm Rhett. And I'm Link. This week at the round table of dim lighting, we're gonna talk about stuff that you've told us that you're really into. Mm. And we're probably gonna rip it to shreds. No, <laughs> we're just gonna process it. And assess it, we're, we're gonna, gonna help We're gonna you. assess it. If you need to abandon this thing, we'll let you know that. Uh, if we have some advice that we think that you need to hear as you approach liking this thing, we're just gonna give some perspective. And let what, me what tell you. What do we know? Well, I'll tell you what, yeah. You, we know man, that we've got opinions. This, this bearded man right here next to me has certainly been into a lot of different stuff. If you haven't listened to our Rhett's Layers episode from way back. Oh, throw, throw back. If you, wanna, if you wanna pick apart what Rhett's into or has been into in fleeting fashion over the many years that I've known him. I don't like, that's I, a good I episode take issue with that characterization. To, to listen to. Of um, my layers. Uh, but we're both into things, and so we're qualified to uh, to assess if other people's stuff that they're into is worth it. I'll tell you, there's some, I, I almost said some strange addictions, but it's borderline strange addiction stuff that's happening here, and just some odd, unexpected things um, that I think it's important that we talk about. So. Well, that might be overselling it. I think we got to oversell it. I mean, I think if this, if if this, uh, you know, I'm just trying every to be time I here. tease an episode, you immediately rip it to shreds. Go I, with me. You're too sensational. Because I would say, if if you went your entire life without hearing the things that we're about to say, you'd probably be okay. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know what we're about to say. I mean, that, I'm saying that's you, my best guess at this point. Listen. I'm gonna say some stuff. I think you're gonna have a good that's time. It's gonna change your life. I think you're gonna have a good time. I think that you're gonna, hopefully you're gonna laugh. Hopefully you're gonna f feel like this was a good use of your time and that you were entertained. And if you were one of the individuals that we will be addressing, maybe this could be life changing. But for this, the average person listening who didn't submit one of these things, you know, you can kinda take it or leave it. Well, let's just not do, <laughs> let's not even do it. The, I, the, hold on, you gotta understand what I'm doing. I'm doing reverse psychology. Yeah, you're doing what you've learned in 20 years of marriage. Right. Lower the bar. Yes, because then they really, like, man, you know what? I'm really glad I listened and Rhett told me that I wouldn't be. Then the next time, they'll be like, maybe it's always worth listening. This episode's gonna suck, but if you love us, you'll <laughs> stick with us. I'll tell you something I'm into right off the bat because something happened to me and it was strange. I'm I'm getting really into physical therapy because I've been into physical fitness, but it might. That's an interesting thing to get at into. Our age, usually physical therapy is something you get into because you were prescribed it for a specific condition. And I was. I currently have a prescription for physical therapy sitting in my car, unused. Yeah, that's that's called a. You're a card carrying middle aged man <laughs> is basically what that means. I'm into physical fitness, which at my age means I'm into physical therapy. Okay. I think that you, when you're think, if you go into a gym and they give you a contract, just go ahead and say, okay, I'm gonna add in the cost of physical therapy on top of this. I com let me just say, I completely agree. I completely disagree with you because I'm not saying that working out doesn't make you injury prone, but not working out makes you more injury prone definitely than you would have been because listen, my back is in better shape than it's ever been, hasn't caused me trouble, and I firmly believe it is because I have been the most consistent with my fitness regimen. Well, so I think that some of those injuries, like I know you've got a bad shoulder, I've got a bad shoulder, I got the bad knee now, hopefully that's getting better, mm -hmm. but I have to believe that it's not as bad as if I was just in atrophy all the time. I started going to the gym years ago because my right shoulder was hurting and I, I went to physical therapy for a while and it made it better and then I wanted to maintain. But then my left shoulder started hurting. I said, you know what, I need to get back it into some, left out. some physical therapy to, to just to just get this thing hanging right again or something, I don't know what. And you, you know, we, we both been in physical therapy. I prefer, I've been in the two types of physical therapy. There's the one where you're in a large room with a lot of other people. Yeah. And then there's the one where I have a physical therapist that I go to from time to time who uh, she just has an office and it's just her and you're in an office and that's it. And that second scenario has proven much more effective for me personally. And yeah. I know you've experimented with both as well, but now yeah. you're going to the wide, the open now, area again. It's an open area, but it's one it's one-on-one -on -one physical therapy. And there's not 
Sometimes there's one other person in there, usually. Because I went to one where they rotated on me. Yeah, I did that too. That, that, that's, that's a bit no impersonal. Good. That's no good. You feel like you feel like like cattle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some focus. Anyway, I go in there, um, and I'll just use the first name Jane. Is that real? I, did I learn my lesson to not? Should I call her PT Patty? <laughs> <laughs> this is not. This is not, well, who knows? I don't think my stories are incriminating, then I start telling them and they probably are. But I, I love Jane. She's, she's, she's a great person. I give her five stars on my review, okay? If, if you were to leave one. Um, but, but you, you know, when, when, you're give, when you're therapizing Link Neal, I guess you get into weird territory, so I'll say that it's on me, not on her. But here's what happened. I go in there and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hypermobile and my shoulders, I, I'm not doing my exercises correctly at the gym. I'm not, you know, I'm not setting my my shoulders back and engaging my traps whenever I'm like doing exercises, and my shoulders are getting hyperextended. But then her immediate assessment when I walked in, what, why is that confusing? You're making understand. a confusing face. Your shoulders are hyperextended. If you like, let's just say I did a bent over row, like I'm bent over facing the ground, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna pull some weights up. To my size, I'm a you know. You're using order, too much shoulder and not enough back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to set your shoulders, roll your shoulders back and down to engage your 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 lats, in order to then protect your shoulders so that they don't hyperextend out. Um, okay. But then when I go in there, she's immediately assessing my posture and everything. I walk out of there the first time with like special flip flops. She gave you special flip flops. Well, she sold me special flip flops. That how can a flip flop be special? Your your foot nestles around the arch in such a way as to Reduce invite the flop. your heel to be in the right place, so that you're not putting your. You know, if you watch people walk and you see people walk, and they put they put weight on the on the right side of their heel, on the left side. They're not they're not centering their weight, and I'm sure you've heard this. If you're not walking correctly, if your feet aren't interacting with the terrain correctly, it has a ripple effect through your whole body. Any right physical ther therapy will tell you that everything is connected in your body. So I go in there for my so shoulder. So do they flop though? What, my feet? The flip flops, do yeah, they, they flop? they flop. Okay. You, you got a problem with flopping? No, I just thought that, I don't, un I don't understand mechanically how they work and I thought that maybe like if they, when, oh, my well, heel, these, these when my only heel fly strikes, if you're walking wrong, they train me to when my heel strikes to distribute the weight centered on the heel and not to the right. How come I haven't seen you wearing these? Especially my right foot. I, I wear them around the house. I'd like you to wear. I wear them, them in. to physical therapy. I'd like you to wear the flip flops in. I have them in my bag. I wear them. I wear them home. Are they fashionable? It's not really warm enough. But no, they're just they're not. Un they're just black. Okay. I'd like to get to my story. <laughs> I just uh, you're you're raising a lot of questions as you go. That's um, all I gotta say. the The main thing about my shoulder, I mean, she's working on my posture and holding my shoulders back and and my my head back so I'm not hunched over, you know. So I'm I'm filling my lungs with air and I'm puffing my chest out and I'm being proud to be who I am. She says things like that to me, and then she lays me down on this log of a. A fitness log, I call it. It's just a long styrofoam cylinder, and I lay on that on my back, and then I splay my arms out, and I lay there for 15 minutes doing snow angels. This is this is my task, and I'm supposed to do Flip this every day. Flip flops and snow angels. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking good, and it's basically to open up, bring my shoulders back. They flop. If you want to flop, my shoulders flop down on either side of the fitness log and my arms go out, so my chest opens up, okay? And it stretches my pecs, and it's everything's kind of closing down, I need to just open it back up. And after doing this a few days, the second time I go in there, I'm like, I've got a hitch in my giddy up. When I lay down on this log, and I start doing the snow angel, when I get right, my arms right here at like two o'clock, two and 10 o'clock, in my, ch I feel this pain in my chest, like right around here. On one side? And it, on the right side, but then it goes all the way back to my shoulder blade. She says, well that sounds like your rib. And I'm like, well I do have this rib that kind of sticks out right here. 
And if you might get, when I put my arm up, you might be able to see it. Don't touch it. Huh? I, I gotta touch it. Just tell, Wait, I'm gonna touch it gent gently, right there. You feel that? And it's it's not on the other side as much. It's more on this side. Yeah, on the but right. I mean, I would say that's I said, mild. I remember my mom telling me that I had a fused rib. I didn't know what that meant, and she said maybe that's it. But then she started feeling of it, and it's like right here to the right of my sternum, in the middle of my chest, above my nipple, towards the middle. It just feels like the the ribs poking out. And she and so I'm laying there and she starts just doing what you did. She immediately starts feeling of it and rubbing it. And I just started I'm I started squirming. I would have started laughing when and people then, when they touch my chest like if they're doing a massage and then they turn me over and they start working the top of the shoulders and they anytime the little little tickles fingers on. like get down into the top of the pecs I'm like <laughs> Well, let me tell you. <laughs> I started Just laughing. Embarrass myself. I, I started laughing, and I did embarrass myself, and it was like, <laughs> <laughs> you don't. But it's it, so it, embarrassing I, I to laugh. I wasn't. I was not. I wasn't actually. It was uncomfortable laughter. It's the same type of laughter that I exude when people start talking about blood flow. Yeah. You know that freaks me out. Yeah. And I was like. <laughs> like a grunting laughter, kind of like squirming, getting wow. away from her. And she's like pushing on my rib and like Was she responding to your laughing? And before she could respond, I was like, I, I'm, I'm sorry for laughing. It just makes me really uncomfortable. I actually feel queasy when you touch it. And then she said, you touch it. Hmm. And I was like, I don't like touching that spot. <laughs> I don't like touching that rib. I, I never touch it because it makes like me feel that, queasy. That pointy spot. And she took some ointment. This is L.A. She took some CBD ointment. She 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 took my hand out. She put ointment on my hand, and then she said, "Just rub it." And I'm like, I put my hand under my shirt. Why is this such? I understand like rubbing. Actually, I can't think of a part of my body that it would be weird for me to rub. <laughs> it's like I'm trying. Yeah, to, I, I, having someone else rub different. It's but me rubbing my body. The whole point of being ticklish, it's my kryptonite. The tick, the ticklishness comes from the unexpected nature, not it, being able to anticipate what's going to happen next. But when you you can't it, tickle yourself, we talked about this on the show. I'm not tickling myself. Well, I'm you're making freaking myself yourself I'm, out I'm by freaking touching myself your own out. rib. Yeah, because I feel like it's not in place, and like I'm touching it. I don't. I just feels gross to me. Because it sticks out, man. It's nasty. You got lots of things that stick out, though. Like, like do, all, do all of them? So I start touching it, and I, I, I try to be obedient, and I'm like, I'm rubbing this spot, and I'm like, she can tell I'm really uncomfortable, and she starts giving me this speech. Hmm. She says, that rib is, is not mobile. It's, and it's, you get the pain all the way to the front and the back because it doesn't like to move like all the other ribs. Something's happened to you in the past. And I told her I broke my pelvis. She was like, "Well, you might have done it then when you, when you, busted your ass and broke your pelvis and got a concussion in college." And I said, "Well, whenever it is, I still don't like touching it." And she's like, "You need to invite that rib to the party. It doesn't have to eat anything, but it does have to show up." She's saying all this. Oh, while this is the analogy. I'm, this is she this goes is her into that many layers of the analogy. She goes into that many layers about while, whether or not the rib has to eat. Yeah, while I'm rubbing my own chest. She, this woman's a genius. She, she is trying to distract you. She, she, she got you thinking about how weird her analogy was and you're, <laughs> next thing you know, you're rubbing that rib. I'm rubbing that it. rib and having a, it's a party. I can rub it now. And she said, I mean it's still a little uncomfortable as I'm trying to do it, but she's like, you know what? I understand that it makes you queasy, but this is part of your body and your brain is telling you that something's wrong with it and you need to get comfortable with it being the way it is before we can see some progress. Hold on, but what are we, how are we gonna fix it? Doesn't have to eat. Do you want me to push don't. hard on it? I, no, I, she pushed hard on it, don't you push I on it. I think I can distract you, tell you a little bedtime story about the rib going to the party and then Boom! Like it's scaring somebody when they got hiccups. I'll just press it in real quick with a lot of force, and it'll it'll dislodge. Let me do it. I'm not. I have a physical therapist. Her name is Jane. She tells me wonderful stories but about she, rib people. But she didn't get it. To she didn't fix it. It takes time. I gotta say the mentally. Other, it, this is this is like mental therapy too, dude. Well, it's kind of reminiscent. I bet you have a rib that needs to come to a party. That's exactly what I was about to say. I bet you if I went to this woman, she would find a rib that needed to go to a party as well because I think, not, not nothing against her, 
I think this might be a little bit like chiropractic medicine, which I understand that there's there's benefit in chiropractic medicine, but there's also a lot of woo-woo in chiropractic medicine because no matter who you are, if you go to a chiropractor, you think they're gonna be like, you're perfectly in balance, please go home. No, they always say, you're a little bit out of alignment, let me do this. I, has anyone ever been to a chiropractor who didn't tell them that they were out of alignment? The only chiropractor I went to is the one we made a commercial for. Right. The cracked chiropractor. Look up that commercial if you're interested. Well, or don't. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I kind of feel like this is like one leg is a little bit longer than the other kind of thing. No, no she, she was addressing my mental block. You think you really got a rib that's not coming to the party? You think that's real? Yeah, man, yeah, yeah. She, I mean, it can well, be do loosened it, up. How do we get if, it to come to the party? Get, probably touching and pushing on it. <laughs> but I have to get a little more comfortable with that. How often are you now touching and pushing on it? I haven't since the since the party analogy. And right now, I'm touching it a little bit, okay? I I'm feel pushing like, on it. I ah. feel like every night you need to, you gotta push hard, because I think what's gonna happen, <laughs> you're gonna be sitting there one How night. Do you don't know. You're gonna push and it's gonna go, and all your problems are gonna go away. And, not ju and just like chiropractic, not just your rib problem, all your problems are gonna go away. <laughs> if you can get that rib in, in alignment, everything else in your body will like dominoes. You'll be like a transformer, and you'll be suddenly in great health. She says that I need to like, Put my chin back and my chest out. Like I take issue with that too because like I've never thought of you as a person with bad posture. I think I got much worse posture than you. You don't. You're always sitting you upright. You're, you, I mean, have you ever, Link sits upright all the time, doesn't he? He doesn't. He he not hunched at all, man. I think I'm a like see the difference between not, this. No, look at me. I'm always hunched because I'm a because, tall boy. Just because you have problems doesn't mean I don't have lesser problems <laughs> that I'm dealing with. Don't it's called envy, Rhett. You have you bringing me down. I'm telling you that you have good posture is not called envy. <laughs> I'm telling you that if I were to line up all of my friends and I and there was a spectrum of good posture to bad posture, just eyeballing it in my brain right now you'd be on the top end of good posture. When I watched. Now pointy ribs, you'd also be up there as well. When I watched back the vlog where we were playing disc golf with tortillas, I don't even know if that video's out yet, but when I watched the the first shot of that, of me like teeing off and like throwing the Frisbee tortilla, I was like, man, I'm not athletic looking. <laughs> well, that's a totally different I'm not, thing. I'm goofy looking, like I gotta, I gotta have a more athletic stance. But that's not your posture. And I think that's, that's just the your key. Technique. That's the key to my shoulder getting better, for everything being tightened together. Looking cooler while doing things is the key well, to getting better? <laughs> don't tell me you don't believe that. <laughs> I know that's your world Well, view. I will say that from an athletic perspective that the way that I've always tried, like the way that I tried to figure out how to swing a golf club was watching people on television who knew how to, how to do it. I was like, I don't really know exactly what's happening, but if I can make my swing look more like Tiger Woods swing, then it'll probably result in something good. I have found this to be true. So if you can look at Frisbee golfers of the world and be like, I'd love to look like that. <coughs> you don't even need to know exactly what's happening. You just need to look like them. And you'll probably be in good shape. Well, it's gonna start with a party where my rib is gonna be there. Are my ribs invited to the party? Sure. They don't have to eat, but they do need to be there. Okay. I'm glad we cleared that up. You have a new shirt on. I do. Uh, this is B or Mythical Best. And then 3D, man. It's got B or Mythical Best written under it. This is like this is like advanced graphics, graphics stuff. You know what I'm Two saying? Two graphics in one. This is like something that me and you would never come up with because we're too, we we think too to inside the box when it comes to graphics. Yeah. We'd be like, hold on, you for, you put another graphic underneath the graphic, you do, do you need to delete that layer before we sell this shirt? That's, That's what we'd say. This is, an, in other words, you're crapping on our merch. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm saying that that's what makes it cool. Our merch has gotten huh, way better since me and you Stop being the ones figuring out what was gonna go on the stuff. Yeah, man, we're so proud of it. Look yeah. at him wearing it. Mythical.com, check out all the designs that have unexpected twists, turns, shadows, and redundancies. And coming soon to uh, mythical.com, a shirt that has a built-in foam rib that you can rub. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a bump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got a bump underneath it. Yeah, rub it to your heart's content. And it says, rub here. And there's and there's also it comes with a packet of CBD oil. <laughs> rub, 
rub here to come to the party. Dang it. We, okay, maybe we should be giving more ideas for merch. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably expensive to uh, produce. <laughs> You wanna take a look at some of these questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you gonna start? Let's just start here at the top. Uh, these aren't questions, these are things that y'all are into. Amy Smith. Amy, what are you into? I love smelling things. <laughs> From entire stores like tire shops or Home Depot, to Windex and Comet, to old books and old photographs, the smell of skunks, gas, and even manure don't bother me, I just love to smell things. I I think this is this is great because to me this is this is a form of being in like being in the moment. Like you don't typically like I mean th the reason that the saying stop and smell the roses is what it is is because you don't typically do that. You don't typically stop and focus on the scent of something. Yeah I mean if if something is pungent or it's eliciting something that is a, like a warning, it triggers a warning in your nose, like oh my gosh, somebody farted, I gotta get away. But if something smells good and it's like, oh that smells good, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna suck it in. Like this is this is a meditative uh, well, mindfulness but the thing type of a thing. I, the thing I really relate to in this, Amy, is your desire not just to smell good things, but just to smell things, right? Yeah. And I think that one of the things that I enjoy is you know strong flavors. Like I think that anybody who likes black licorice kind of understands that. Is it that you actually think that it tastes good, or you're into that? Uh, you talked about it on the podcast or on GMM. The taste masochism. The concept yeah. of you're 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 a masochist when it comes to taste, and you like strong flavors. You like bitter. You like blue cheese and black licorice. And I, I think the reason it's I like those things simulating is simulating danger, but in the confines of safety. It's like eating a poison berry without the consequences of the poison, yeah. right? And, but it's 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 an experience. And uh, I, these last three things that you that you mentioned: skunks, gas, and manure are like that might be my top three. I mean like I well it I, depends I, on the it depends on the type of animal manure. You, but no, but you know like, like a, what they like used to do pig, it pig manure? No thank you. Cow manure But you know what they yeah. used to do at NC State where they'd bring in the fresh mulch that had the manure mixed into it and yeah. you can tell like, oh there's this high smell. That's cow shit. And it's like, ooh they oh they, there's fresh manure on campus today and it's like some people are like, what's that smell? It stinks and I'm like I like it. I like it. I hate it, and that's why I love it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what it is. It's an ex it's it's an evocative experience. Or a skunk. Well, like my my dad used to say, De it was a dead. It's a dead polecat when you smell a skunk when you're just driving down the road, because apparently when a skunk dies. dies, it releases its glands. I don't know. Yeah, and also just stinks because it's dead. Um, I definitely and I, like and smelling I always, of a book. I always like that. Um, but books are books are nice. I do not smell my toenails. I do. I do not smell the inner in, inner workings of my belly button, usually. That would be difficult, I'm not that flexible. With your finger. You mean stick and then pull and smell? Yeah. Sample and smell? Stick and, stick and ream and smell, ream I don't out. think my belly button smells bad. Uh, well I don't, I don't, out. oh yes, find out. Well let's let you find out. It smells totally fine. I don't smell anything. Some day, it just smells like I'm, a finger. Well, listen, you, you've got a sample size of one day. You need to do this every day. Do you, during your really uh, meticulous lathering routine that you do with the shower not going, do you always lather everything, including the belly button? Yes. I cannot tell you the last time I washed my belly button or my legs. <sighs> It's gross, man. It's not gross, they smell fine. Smell my legs, smell my belly button. I'm not gonna smell your legs. I'll put my legs or my belly button up against anybody's and I bet you they're just as fine. Well, you need to ask permission first before you do that. I wash all crevices in my face and I feel like I'm doing good. You wash your toes? Uh, weekly. Well then that's a, that's a bunch of crevices. I know There's but- There's four crevices I, there. Here, the thing is is that I, just, I feel like you're drying your stuff out, man. 
Showers are not even a natural thing. Sarah, what is the flame princess as her moniker on Twitter says, what is she into? Bones, but more specifically, and this may seem effed up, human bones, okay. I want a human skull more than words can express. There's something about facing your own mortality by looking into the empty eye sockets of a once living person and seeing yourself. Oh, this is, is this wicked or is this insightful? Well, again, I know I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dark person, but uh, I very much relate to this as well. And I, when we went to- Human uh, skull. We went to the Voodoo M Museum in mm -hmm. New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess I'd recommend it. Well, it's not much of a time commitment. <laughs> right, it was like a 13 minute. Pretty much in and out. And we were really squeezing squeezing all the juice out of that experience. And uh, there are several human bones, animal bones, but definitely human bones, including some human skulls. And I gotta say, there is something we, very. We were trying to figure out if they were real and we did conclude because they were just out there. I mean, this is like a house that you walk through. Well, the human skulls were in the one that I, the one that me and you and Britain were looking at was in a glass it, box. Come, yeah, it was in a glass box. But that one was real. It was def, it was real, man. Yeah, it's like the detailing on that thing. Um, I, I get this. I didn't. It, I didn't process it much at the you, time. How would you get a human skull? You got to kill somebody. Well, how would you thing. do it legally? Oh. I wonder. How does one acquire a human skull? Yeah, I'm sure you. Well, legally, okay. Well, Jenna, that, can you can you look that up? Yeah. I, if well, you need to, you want? Do you feel like you need to go into incognito mode or something? Let's see if the web computer think, allows me to search this. Go on the dark web. Yeah, you, you can do it. I know that you can get a human skull if you're a, how a, does a medical one acquire professional. A human skull. Like if you're a med if you're a teacher. You can have a you can have a skeleton in your classroom. I know a lot a majority of those are fake, just molds. But yeah, I'm why would it sure need to be real? Because it's cooler. It is cool. To know this was a person, and now they just hang out in this classroom all the time. So you're you're into this. You're into what Sarah's into. Human bones. I get it. I I definitely. I don't know if I would have been into it until she said that. It's, it helps her face her own mortality by looking into the empty eye sockets. I think that kind of re redeems it. Oh, Jenna just Jenna made a, found an interesting face. What, what did you find? There's a website. Etsy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I say the website? Yeah. It's called The Bone Room. The Bone, the bone Room. room .com? Bone Room .com. Bone Room .com. Bone Room.com. I don't know what happens if you put the the in Well, there. how much for a human skull? Um, and how do, they, how do you know it's real? Normal? Human skull? What do you mean a normal human? Yeah, no, an ab. They have other options. I don't want an abnormal human skull. That, that's well, you might. That's a. That's like a. That's I want an extra big one. Okay. That's creepy on creepy. At least two thousand dollars. Only starting listen, price two thousand dollars. Wait, there's one that was for four hundred. So I don't know. Well, whose was is. that? Do they do they have names? Um, this is Henry. The four hundred one was an antique uncut male skull. Antique uncut male skull for 400 bucks. So these are just like skulls that are out there on the market. All right. That's, gonna, what, that's what I'm gonna get rep for Christmas. He'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna get one. He'll I'll, forget. I want one. Just forget I said that. I'll get it for your birthday. Okay. I'll be happy. Let's move on to another one because I'm creeped out. Marcel Van Workoven. Okay. Um, I'm into puppets. I like building, performing, and watching them. Okay. I think they're really cool because they have this weird ability to connect with people that I feel even sometimes people can't. That's probably why people find them to be creepy. Hmm. Puppets. Okay, so you. There's a lot that could be said about puppets. When you, when, you, when you read I'm into puppets and you stopped there for a second, I was like, okay, that's all I need to hear. It's not a good idea. And then he goes on, I like building, performing, and watching them. Okay, this dude, if, if we're gonna rip this guy to shreds for his love of puppets, but now he's an actual, what, he's we're not a gonna, creator. We're not gonna rip anybody freaking, to shreds, He's man. freaking, Marcel is freaking real life Geppetto. I, I, I hear, my. He's, he's crafting puppets, performing and watching other people perform with them. So we gotta, we gotta be careful. Well, we, I, 
my assessment of puppet loving, well, because my knee jerk reaction it. is my assessment uh-huh. of being into puppets is that we are in magic territory here. We did a whole episode about this. You mean magician territory? Yeah, magician territory. Yeah, and that is 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 being into puppets cool? Um, is Let me being, think about that for is a being split a second. magician no. cool? <laughs> Look at Jen. Dark Crystal is so cool. Hold, hold on, listen. I, let me, let me finish. Cool. Now, Dark Crystal, She's but getting you, okay. Hold on, you're talking about like Jim Henson. You're talking about like next level labyrinth shit. And that, we're not, we're not, we're not talking about that. We're just talking. I mean, I don't know. I haven't seen Marcel's puppets, but I'm just saying the decision to get into puppets uh, is like the decision to get into magic. And here's here, well, just like I said. You don't get into magic or get into puppets because being into either one of those things is cool in the very superficial, traditional cool what sense of what cool is. You get into it because it's something that you like to do, but you need to you need to understand that because of the way society works, you will be perceived in a certain way by certain people if you get into these things, and you just got to be ready to embrace that. I just wonder how. How many opportunities there are for public puppet work these days? I mean, there's. It's 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 just got to be about the love of puppets, because I, the people that break through in puppet in puppetry, mm-hmm. it's a very small percentage of people. We knew a guy. Do you remember uh, a few years ago? We we knew this guy. He was like a friend of a friend. He had the big gauged ears. I don't remember this. And uh, he was a puppet. He was a puppet man, and he was uh, and he worked for Jim Henson. And he taught our kids like puppets at um, or art or something at the homeschool co-op that the kids were a part of. Okay, okay. That dude, first of all, he was the coolest puppeteer. So maybe I'm taking everything back. He had large gauges, you know, like the kind that you could hang a puppet on each ear. Okay, if you wanted to. And you could stick a puppet finger, maybe you could stick a puppet hand, depending on the puppet, through his ear. Oh yeah. And I feel like if you can stick a puppet's arm through your own ear, then you're cool whether you do puppets or not. Like if Fred Rogers, Daniel the Tiger can jump through your ear hole, <laughs> then you're cool? Yeah. Okay. And, and the thing about it is if you've got large gauged ears, which is not something that I personally recommend, but it's not something that I personally judge either. I can, my ear's itching. I'm gonna take that rib that's sticking out and I'm gonna pull it out and stick it right through your ear Shut and make up. a gauge. Um, if you are the kind of person that has gauged ears, you should balance that with being into puppets. And if you are into puppets, you should ga- you should balance that with being doing something like getting crazy piercings. Now claymation. A pierced puppeteer, that's a whole thing right there. I'm, Go to that website. I pierced, think claymation, that's cool. Piercedpuppets.com, is that a website? Can you look that up? Um, Oh, <laughs> pierced puppets. I mean, you're back into voodoo at that point, aren't you? Uh, you oh, you mean like a uh, yeah voodoo doll? Lara Ben Croft at mixed underscore veggies underscore is into brushing my teeth in the shower. Not my teeth. Lara's into brushing her teeth in the shower. Anything at piercedpuppets.com? Uh. Yeah, it, okay. I moved on because I'm, I wasn't hopeful. <sighs> Brushing, you ever brush your teeth in the shower? I used to. I used to. I have strong opinions about this now. But I, but you go first because you're the shower man. <laughs> I'm the shower man? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, every second in the shower is just water down the drain. And, well, unless you turn it off while you lather. So. Which I do that. Um, yeah, so like doing more stuff in the shower to like I don't know, I don't like wasting that amount of water. Even though we're not in a drought here in Los Angeles well, anymore. Well, it's interesting because the here's what I was gonna say. As of someone who doesn't um, turn off the water to lather, but also as I indicated, my lathering process is not nearly as thorough as Mr. Neal's. Uh, therefore, it doesn't take me but about 17 seconds, so that's not a lot of water. Um, yeah, and it probably gets washed off before it's actually caught the nasties. I step out of the stream to lather and then I get back into the stream. But that being said, uh, I used to brush my teeth in the shower 
in North Carolina. You know, you're surrounded by water there. It's like there's ponds every four feet, creeks. It's like you don't you don't get a sense that the water is in sh- is in short supply when you're in North Carolina, right? And um, have you ever seen Jordan Lake? Full of water, and uh, except when it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I would brush my teeth in the shower. But two things have changed. Number one, I've moved to California where I I've been sort of you can't avo- you can't avoid yes. being more conscious about the water supply. But also, this is, I don't know if they're a sponsor on this episode, but uh, Quip, I'm u- because I'm using the Quip toothbrush and I'm brushing for two minutes, which is how long you should be brushing. Yeah. Two minutes of brushing in the shower for a man who's not gonna turn the water supply off. Yeah, that's irresponsible. I just move it, I am completely move it to a different part of my day. I don't like the idea or of different part of the keeping morning. my toothbrush in the shower. I don't like the idea of other people showering, and yeah, that's just my wife. But yeah, I don't want my wife's stuff rebounding off my offage. Your wife, wife's offage. Yeah, where she's like, and then get getting on my toothbrush. Does your wife lather as much as you do? Um, I'm sure she doesn't. That would be impossible. Does she have a shower system? I haven't asked her because I don't want to have a fight. Hold on, y'all have never showered together? Well, right when we shower together. It's not as much about getting clean. But has there ever? In fact, it's quite the <laughs> hold, hold on, hold on. But has there ever been? A time when we're just like both independently in the shower, just showering, just washing? No. Really? There's been a couple of times, I mean, I'm not. When I, it's like she's got a shower and you've got a shower, but you're than, not, there's not any shower play? Less than a dozen times during 19 years of marriage. We have showered at the same time because of convenience, not because of other desires. Okay. There's been, other, there have been those scenarios where, you know, shower play. <laughs> but what I'm talking about is showering at the same time because you both need to get into the shower. Why is that what you're talking about? Because the other thing is the interesting thing to talk about. Well, no, let's talk about on. sex in the shower. Uh, hold on, but right, no. everybody. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I was I was trying not to talk about that. It's dangerous. But hold you on, you gotta be careful about your footholds. I'm not, I'm not moving on. I'm gonna keep coming back to this. Well, I'll talk about it when you're done. But the fact that I I think that your routine, your shower routine, is so regimented that no one else could fit into it anyway. We get first of all. Your shower has two independent shower heads. Your shower is built for two people to take a shower at the same time, am I right? Well, the current house I'm in, but the other ha- homes that I've lived in, that was not the case. Oh. And I still did it. What would y'all do, just alternate who's under under the water? Yeah. You might as well just wait until she's done Well, sometimes done you do like a Patrick, Patrick Swayze and ghost kind of thing, like she might be lathering and you might come up behind yeah, her but if that's help not, her lather. Okay, so now you're talking about. No, no, but it's, fun- it's for function. Is, I mean, it, yeah, it's a little sensual, but it doesn't have to be sensual or practical. It can be both. In fact, when it's both, it's beautiful. Where the sensual meets the practical. It sounds like a tagline for a class that you would see <laughs> at a yoga studio that you could tear off in Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sh- I just don't, I mean, shower it, play it's too where tight. sensual meets practical. It's too, way too tight quarters to just be in the shower together. Just to you've got a get big clean. shower. I've been in it. Yeah, and I was in there too. <laughs> right, it's not tight yeah, quarters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know. It just seems like that's a personal space unless it's unless you're sorting the mail. If you're sorting the mail in the shower together, then go for it. But like I said, you got to be calculated about you gotta have a good foothold or handhold, you gotta, you just can't. I don't play that game. The height difference is too extreme for that to be safe. Yeah, and it, yeah, it's always been, for me it's always been, I mean it's, it's always rewarding, I'm not gonna say that, but it's, it's almost like it's too challenging. It's like, and the the level of dangers and and potential personal injury involved with like slippage and stuff, it's just there's too much anxiety associated with it. I mean, you don't want to you don't want to have that much pressure. You know, that's not that's not good for performance. Performance. I'm I'm just not into making love in the shower. 
Okay, this is what this has become. But brushing your teeth, you're also not into, which was the original. Question. I liked that in principle, um, but I gotta remember to bring my toothbrush in and then put it away, because I like it in my drawer so it's not out. I don't like leaving my toothbrush out. Uh, next, next thing that someone is into from BYM Beth, I like that. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. I'm really into going to show homes that I know I'll never buy. Oh, like an open house. It's purely it's just like, out of nosiness. You see the sign, the house is for sale. You know, there's a lot of cars parked around here. It's, oh, they're all going into this open house. Now you know that this is my, my dad, uh, this is my dad's pastime. Really. The, Gr growing up, we just, we'd find houses that I knew were, that you would drive around neighborhoods just to drive around neighborhoods and look at houses. Not, and to go into houses that were that, that were open houses. Okay, okay. In fact, when 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 they came out here uh, a couple years ago, we went into like a really nice neighborhood somewhere, and um, somewhere in town where there's like multi million dollar homes, like up in the hills, and you just go on a Sunday afternoon, drive around, and you get to walk into these awesome houses. The, those level That's of fun. houses still have open ha home policy things. Uh, they let just people walk in off the street? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, I, maybe not like, I'm not, I'm not talking about like a $20 million home, I'm talking about like a $4 million home. Okay. You know, which in the Hollywood Hills or something like that, it's like, I mean, it's, you, 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 there's some interesting stuff. I've done it a couple of times, so you, t you tell me how you've dealt with this because my Whether thing, I use the bathroom or not? Yeah, one time I did. My thing is you go in there and there's a real estate agent who kind of greets you at the door and there's like they're they're giving out handouts with all the information on the house to potential buyers. Now I know I'm not a potential buyer in the few times that I've done this, but I found myself acting like a potential buyer as opposed to just saying, you know what, I'm just here to look around. I think they can look in your eyes. They've done this long enough if they're good at it and they're selling the houses that are worth walking through to know in a split instance whether you're there as a potential buyer or just to look around because like BYM Beth, you're just into it. But I found myself just instinctively lying. Oh yeah, so, so um, what are the comps? You know, it's like I go into the kitchen, there's another agent. The kitchen agents. These nice houses, they got they got double teaming with agents. Mm -hmm. um, and they're baking bread just to make the house smell like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got they got tricks up their sleeve. You know, they sell a uh, candle. Well, they sell candles that smell like baked bread, but they sell this um, thing that looks like a loaf of bread that has an oil in it. And you put it in the oven when you're showing a home and it makes your whole home smell like baked bread, but it's you don't even have to bake bread, it's just And if you oil. turn the light on for the oven, it, you can see the bread? It looks like bread. And you, what, how do you even know about this? Because I was in a home one time <laughs> where they had it and Jesse was like talking to somebody who was staying Like an homes. open house? Yeah. Whoa. And I don't know if this is like really hit it big yet. Jenna, could you look that up? But she doesn't need to look that up. No, Jenna, don't look that no, up. No, because it, I, it, no one, I don't don't waste your no, fingers. Please, please look it up. Uh, fake baked bread oven pff, smell what home. I don't search. Are you like giving clues and password? What are what? That's are we what I do. Game? I don't. I do you. You telling me you search actual questions into Google? I just put all the keywords that it, Google will what, assemble the answer. Three from. would have been plenty. I don't know. I think I had to give fake it home. Fake bread oil would have been enough. No, that would no that, that would just give you fake bread oil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ten clever ways to make your home smell like you've been baking. Yeah, but where do we where do you buy one? How but is there a cost? website? Fakebread dot com. It's all like hacks on like putting it's, vanilla and stuff. We've come up. This with is hacks. Three, this isn't a product. Three good business ideas. When you go into a house, do you tell them? Oh, uh, don't. I'm just looking around. Amazon's. Or got do it. you, do you start lying like I do, and you're like, I don't, I don't. Oh, bread oil. Fresh bread spray. Fresh bread. Oh, that's a little different. The thing I'm talking about, you put it in the oven. But it's anyways, like a ceramic bread that you drizzle oil on. Yeah. So, I I typically have an initial conversation that makes it seem like they're, if they're like, like they don't need to waste their time. If on they're you? like you're looking. So you guys, 
you guys interested in buying? If they ask a question, I'd be like, be like you know, yeah, eventually. So you do lie. <laughs> well, no, that's not, that's true. I am eventually gonna buy a house. In the hills? Somewhere. <laughs> okay. You know? But you're lying. You're not looking at that house to buy it. You know me though. I could go up. But for, when you say okay, I could go up for a Sunday afternoon just for kicks, and the next thing you know, I'm like with a lawyer <laughs> buying the thing just because I'm so impulsive. But but no, I, I'm just I'm just saying, I because I want them to. Well, I I, I want I want them to. You. I don't want them to. I want a perfect balance. I don't want them to look at me like. I wish he wasn't in here walking around. He's just wasting my time. And I also don't want them to interact with me and try to follow me around the house. I'm just in there. I prefer them to not be there. I'm just there to explore. So you say something that keeps them from giving you dirty looks, but also it's like, I don't think he's serious. I'm not gonna follow him around. I'm not gonna ask him questions. That's the balance that you want. But they know. They know you they know they know the deal. You should do But I do get this. It is fun to look at homes, especially when it's you're It's actually like, a fun afternoon. When you're lying to like a real estate agent, that is fun. You know, that's it's actually a good, I suggest this like as a F creative date, a creative date, and this could, sometimes this thing might move things a little forward too fast if you're not actually serious, but you're dating somebody, I would say, if you've dated somebody for more than two months and less than one year, because after one year, this would no, just, it's not even fun anymore to do this. Okay. Pretend that you're a married couple looking for a home. Two months of dating? Yeah. You're gonna present, you're gonna pretend you're married? Listen, you know me, I, I think I think like I'm in a movie, man. I don't, I, I'm not gonna do the, lo, play, do the long play, the slow play thing. It's like, I'm like, yeah, it's like, it's actually a way to like You're not roll. gonna do anything because you're married. I, I'm talking about the proverbial me that's not married that at one time wasn't married. This is the kind of thing that I would have done the with Jesse. The fantasy single ret? I'm saying that this is a good idea because it's kind of like a role play to feel like it, what it would be like to be a couple. And then you what? Go into the shower and sort the mail together. <laughs> no, you can't use the shower, but I have urinated at an open house, but I've never taken a dump. <laughs> Yeah, you better hope that bread oil is in the bathroom. <laughs> if you're gonna have to take somebody's it down, been baking man. bread in here, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> somebody's been baking some pumpernickel in here. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, why you why you baking think some pumpernickel because it's hot, it's dark brown, and you have to pump it. Baking some pumpernickel is like a dookie, man, because <laughs> it's dark. Because it's dark. <laughs> that was a good joke, and most okay. people got it. Uh -oh. yeah. I think we should, let's go to the next page. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. We just skipped some ones because it. It wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough. <laughs> but you what know you what? were into sucked so bad <laughs> that we just skipped it. We're not even gonna tell you about uh. it. Amy replied to our prompt and said, I really love eating burnt toast. I purposely burn my toast so it, it'll be nice and crunchy. It just has better flavor. To be honest, she spelled flavor with a U, which means that she's probably from the UK or you know somewhere over on that side of the, she's, the pond, she's or else not she American. just doesn't know how to spell flavor. Do you like burnt toast? <sighs> Do you think I like burnt toast? Do you wish I liked burnt toast because you know I don't? Uh, I I would be willing to bet many many dollars that you don't like burnt toast because you don't you don't you differentiate between the darkness of biscuits. Yeah, I want a light biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> every, every time we go to Bojangles or anything with a biscuit, it's like <laughs> you will hear this. You listen, man. You will hear this phrase. I, can you get? Can you give me a light biscuit? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, listen, I don't the, get to go uh, to Bojangles often. It's and when a man I go to Bojangles, who is I'm so like, particular that he has a biscuit preference. <laughs> can I have a, now I don't mean the type of biscuit, I mean the lightness of a biscuit. <laughs> 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 like the opposite of a pumpernickel biscuit. Right. So, yeah, man, I don't go to Bojangles that often. I mean, they're not out here. So when I go back home and I'm gonna maximize my Bojangle experience, I want it to be what I want it to be. I want it to That's be a light biscuit. That's not my impression. My impression isn't that you, I don't go to. You're trying to maximize, is that you would not enjoy the biscuit if it was a dark biscuit. My favorite, uh, it's you're, true. you're racist against biscuits and my you're afraid to admit it. My favorite burger is Shake Shack burger and 
time before last, I went there and I was eating a burger and I was like, something's missing. This is amazing, but it could be more perfect. It's missing onions. If you order just like the Shake Shack burger, there's no onions. You gotta get this, uh, the smokestack. That has. Peppers, they're that awesome. That has the peppers. They are good, but it's like, I like the just the classic taste as well with onions. And I had to make a mental note, next time I go in there, I'm gonna add the onions. It's like, this is my Caramelized or? Yeah, caramelized. Okay. They said we don't have that, but we got something else like that and it is onions. It's like, yeah, that's what I mean, give it to me. Did you stop midway through the burger and get them? I thought about that time before last, but then I just made a mental note to never make that mistake again. And I did the same thing with light biscuits years ago and I've never looked back. I don't like burnt toast because it's burnt. Burnt is a neg is a pejorative term. Mm. But if you like that, that's cool for you. Jack Spratt. Let me, okay, let me give you my perspective on, I'm gonna use, uh, I'm going to use a pan of brownies to make an analogy, okay? So we're not talking toast, we're talking brownies. Fine. And again, I think that this is my philosophy about is, most things in life. This is confusing, but fine. So you got a pan of brownies and you've got people who like the middle brownie and you got people who like edge brownies. Yeah. You got people who like corner brownies, right? Yeah. yeah. And then the way that I look at the brownie pan isn't to like, oh, I'm a middle brownie man. I'm a corner brownie man, I'm an edge brownie man. Honestly, the way I interact with the, with the pan of brownies is, <laughs> what kind of brownie man am I right now? <laughs> and sometimes uh, it'll be like. You just looked at me like you were totally crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, you're saying something that's a good point, but you looked at me like you were crazy. I just think it makes life more interesting to not come to the conclusion of what kind of brownie man you are and just be like, I'm gonna go for the middle and enjoy the gooiness and then I'm gonna go for the corner and I'm gonna get that crispy and I'm gonna enjoy it. And so. Listen, some of us are Optimus Prime and some of us are. And I'm just saying I loser. feel like <laughs> approaching toast in that way makes it so that it's like sometimes, it's, especially when you're not in control because you're not, I mean you're not in control of most of your meals. I mean you're definitely not in control of most of your meals, right, because you don't cook. So therefore, you, you I think I could cook toast if I had to. <laughs> I'm just saying that if you open yourself up to the world of both light biscuits and dark biscuits, then you can you you might appreciate the darkness and the lightness and create a biscuit balance in your life. So all that to say, I like soft things, not crunchy things. I like sometimes I'm in a burnt toast mood. Undercooked things, not burnt things. I get it, and I you know what burnt popcorn that can be good too, it, but it probably causes cancer. Here's a weird one. Like I like, I like, I don't like burnt chicken on the grill, but I like a nice charred piece of chicken. That tastes good to me. But what if the meat gets dry? That's not good. <laughs> yeah, case 22. Uh, okay, Amanda Marie, you're up. You say that, you, she says, I collect caution tape from construction sites that she passes. Okay, this is a problem. I even have two pieces from crime scenes with officer permission. And then she tweeted again after she like thought about what we were probably gonna say and she's like, I guess I should explain it. I collect it because it reminds me of all the places I've seen in the world. <laughs> Wait, you only go to construction sites and crime scenes <laughs> all around the world? Oh, they are all around the world. I even have some in other languages. It's a unique way to document my life. Yeah, it is unique. I I'll give you that, Amanda Marie. Caution tape from construction sites and then two pieces of crime, two pieces from crime scene. First of all. Officer, so the officer permission really only applies, I'm trying, crime to, scene. I'm trying to play Sherlock Holmes here. Yeah, she's and going on construction sites and taking, taking down the stuff that the then people mindlessly walk into <laughs> construction sites into pits and, and all, a plethora of problems. Well, listen, I mean, th this is a, this is You're a, endangering people. This is, let me just make a couple hobby. of observations about Amanda Marie, okay? So Amanda Marie, her Twitter name, Amanda Marie, comma, Bleak Creek, her, her Twitter name is Lost Mythicality. 
and then in her actual profile picture, she's got a picture with us. So we know that Amanda Marie is a good person. <laughs> <laughs> so we know that- We I'm, gotta be, yeah. We, no, no, I'm, gotta, no, I'm not talking about just being nice to her. I'm just saying that I am using what I know about her to deduce. She's got great taste in us. That she is not taking away tape from like around holes and stuff like that. I think this is probably like, oh, I can tell that this part of the construction site is no longer that important. Like, it, you know, they, they finished here, but they, no one's taken this down yet. I'm gonna take a little bit of this tape and add to my large collection of crime scene tape. <laughs> <laughs> or she only goes to construction sites that have officers present mm -hmm. and asks them for per permission. I just don't know how construction site tape is different from place to place enough to then be able to remember where you were. And well, I guess language would help. If you approach this like Kant, then you would ask the question, one of the ways to figure out if whether or not your actions are morally upright is to ask if everyone were to do what I'm doing, what would the net effect in the world be? It'd be a lot less construction tape. <laughs> and I believe that if everyone did this, there would be a lot more construction accidents. Because yeah. eventually, you're gonna get to the good tape. Yeah, Because yeah. everybody else is gonna take it. So I would have to say that I would limit my activity to the crime scenes with officer permission. Yeah, so then you're just creepy, but you're not really um, luring people into an injurious environment. But I will say that second one, the construction tape is kind of like, mm, okay, I don't know about that one. Real the life crime, crime scene, scene tape, that's, that's creepy, but. That's the kind of thing that I could get into. Um, crime scene, do not cross. But you can take a little bit if you want it. Yeah, and, and sometimes I think you can talk to an officer who's got the, I mean, somebody has the role of crime scene tape. I mean, it's coming from somewhere, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, utility you belt situation. Like, I don't want to take you know I don't want to take that. But do you have the roll? Can I have a couple of squares? What of is your this role? conversation like? I mean, you're walking up to the crime scene. There's officers there. They're they're going about their officer business. Uh, excuse me, officer. It's like he's immediately assuming it's like what what happened here? You know, officers got to put up with that crap all the time. What happened here? What's going on? You know, it's like, no, no, no. This is I don't want to know what happened. I just want some of your tape. Can I have some of the tape? It's like, what? It's like, yeah, I collect the tape from places all around the world and you know, it helps me remember where I was when I committed crimes. <laughs> it's like, all of a sudden it you're does, a suspect. You know, you know what? It is exactly the kind like of thing a that a serial would, killer right. would do in a movie. Right. I always visit the crime scenes and ask for the tape. I have a little jovial exchange with the officer and you know what those suckers do? They give me pieces of tape. Right. We, we've made, we've we've accused Amanda of quite a, quite a bit here. But, she's, but she knows us. But we know she's a good person so she's she a good person. Any of that stuff. What do you want? You want a uh, secret lady spider? Oh, this one's this one's from similar to the other one. I put this on there because I thought you'd be into it. Uh, I'm super obsessed with abandoned houses and buildings. I keep a list of ones near me I want to visit and marathon content of people exploring them on YouTube. Yes, I take photos of them and look up their histories of ownership. I don't know why. I just think they're neat. Yeah, I, I have. Um, this is L. Her name's L. Oh, I thought you were beginning to spell something. <laughs> <laughs> this is L I N K reporting for duty. <laughs> but I didn't no, know where you were going. What were you going to say? Uh, you may have told me about the YouTube channel where the guy goes into the old. There's one that where he goes yep. into like old malls and stuff. Yeah, we've talked about there's it. There's a number here. of YouTube. This yep. is a YouTube genre. Well, and I'll tell you a more accessible thing because L, I, I, I'm with you on this. Um, there's a Reddit thread called Abandoned Porn. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like Old pornography porn that's been thrown in a ditch. I which found we, a both bunch of those. a lot of that up. growing yeah. up. Once um, you get to the middle of the magazine, it's usually still intact. Right, right, you gotta, you can't tell you what. Get it, through the soggy, yeah, you the gotta, soggy cover. You gotta get to the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's kinda like a pan of brownies, but the exact opposite. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Soggy on the outside yeah. and crisp in the middle. Oh yeah, <laughs> crisp and taut. Oh gosh. Um, there is a Reddit thread called "Abandoned 
band of porn. And yeah, it's just pictures that people have taken of like st amazing structures. I mean, gosh, I mean, all types of, all types There's of so stuff. much stuff like this and both of us are really into this. There was like a ferry and like, I don't know, down in the bayou or something that was abandoned years ago and there was a flood that took this ferry up the river and then when the flood receded, it just stayed there and it was like a, had a, this, a steamboat with a big steam, wheel in the back. Boat, yeah. The big big wheel in the back? Yeah. Uh, the paddle in the back thing. Paddle steamer. And um, somebody posted a photo of it and then all these people started commenting about where it was and how they'd been to it and every year they would go there to like spend the summer because it was like near this like camping area or something and every year the, the water level would come up and move the ferry and then recede so every year they would come back and it would be in a different location mm. and every year it would be more and more dilapidated and I actually think it's gone now but I don't know how these people discover all these things but. Because you're not I, really supposed to get into a lot of them. Oh yeah. It's, Je it's Jesse gave me a book one year. Very fascinating. Like a coffee table book that was these you know beautiful pictures of the inside of abandoned structures uh -huh. and old hotels and I absolutely love, love uh, looking at these things, but I haven't been in many. You know, like I think all the there's um there's a few like old theaters. Well, it wasn't really abandoned, but the uh, the uh, what is it? Is it the Pacific Theater? Yeah, is it the one on Hollywood? That's Hollywood on, Boulevard. It's the one where one of the Warner Brothers like died of a heart attack in the lobby, and it's where the first Academy Awards was held. Yeah, um, we explored. We that. explored that. Got on the roof. And stuff because we were with somebody who had access to the building. Yeah, we had permission. Like went downstairs and saw the giant air conditioning unit that like super inefficient. It was like a dinosaur with a huge belt, like a like a belt that was you know twenty feet across. And then in one of the one of the cool things about touring was we got to play in all these old theaters and we went into the underbelly of this one theater. Yeah, that's right. And. Uh, it was, I don't know where this one was, but the entire floor of the theater could be on these hydraulic jacks that are like 20, yeah. I mean like 100 years old, it could go up and down, it could come up to meet the stage and then go down. And I don't even know why it worked that way. But yeah, I'm into this. I'd like to, um, you know what, I bet you there's a good, um, I bet you there's some good VR tours that you can take of these old old buildings. That's good. You know, if I knew that, that would be my wreck. I'm gonna give my, you know what, I'll make this my wreck. Uh, if you're on Reddit, the thread is called Abandoned Porn. And like I'm looking at it right now, Medical Wing of Eastern State Penitentiary, Westmoreland Glass Factory in Western Pennsylvania, a castle in New York. Oh, th this one in Bulgaria, Bulzulda Monument, Kazal, Kazanlak, Bulgaria. It's an old Soviet monument now guarded and barred from entry, but it looks like a UFO landed on the edge of a mountain with this big obelisk beside it. It looks like something out of out of James Bond. Um, yeah, they should put that in a movie. It's a, I mean, and then you can read about it because I don't know, e even if there's only like 10 comments, one of those people will know about it. Oh yeah, it's Reddit. It's, it's amazing. People know things. Because when we were kids, we would go into Old we, we would go go out into the woods, and there'd be cabins. Well, next to the in the woods, that it would be trees growing all around it. There'd be no access to it. Do you it. remember know how the they got uh, the? Uh, we went to the cabin. I know Ben and I went there, but then I think you and I went there. Um, in the pasture that we used to chase cows in, where the rocks are. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were to walk, like right where you come into the pasture where we did when we went to Bowie's Creek, but you walk all the way across straight instead of going to the rocks. So you go past the rocks and keep going straight and then go into those woods and keep walking. Mm -hmm. There was an old house that was just sitting in the middle of those woods. It was like a Hansel and Gretel type situation because it was a house that had no path, no road, no indication that there ever was a road because it was so old that the entire woods had grown up completely around it and even trees had grown up into it and it was this old house and we would go in there. And a lot of, I don't remember that one, but a lot of them, you go in the kitchen and there'd be stuff in the cabinets and be old 
This one was way beyond that, like it had fallen Cans apart. and stuff like but that? But there was the one that um, one of our friend's brothers like exploded with dynamite. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that had a, like a fully stocked kitchen with a bunch of old clothes and stuff. That it was super was... creepy. We had a lot of fun there. And then near my nanny's house, like I would drive her golf cart over to this, there was this abandoned house and I went in there and there were hand drawn murals on the wall of anatomically correct women, naked. Anatomically correct, it might be pushing it. You, do you? Did I show it to you? No, I'm just saying, I remember the proportions of the, most of the time the uh, proportions of the parts were no, this is, not this is true very, to life. This is very accurate. Really, it was like a doc, it was like a medical drawing. Yeah, it was. It was. I learned a lot. Okay, uh, uh, and it's funny because on Dolly Parton's America, like that podcast series, she tells she a story about of going learning into a lot about sex an there. abandoned church yeah. that had. I don't know what it is about abandoned homes that make people want to draw like, well, abandoned porn. Well, I you guess don't. The, you don't want to do it in your own home, <laughs> <laughs> especially you if you're going to take a whole wall. Yeah. Where else can uh, you just draw a, a naked person with their legs spread? You can't do that in your house. You gotta do that in an abandoned house. Did I say leg spread or did you remember I told you that before? Because I didn't want, I didn't, I didn't know if I wanted to say that. Well, the, I, the, I've got specific memories of going into abandoned houses and like going into the living room and it's just like a full. Yeah, like a fresco. This is it. Like that's the, I've never seen a fresco get that fresh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think, uh, I think we had a good time. Yeah, hopefully you I learned some things. I think it didn't things. suck. You know, you know, I think if there's any apo apologies owed, let's just go ahead and pre-apologize uh, to uh, Marcel. Yeah, Marcel the puppeteer. for Link saying that he was uh, about to rip him a new one. <laughs> but uh, that didn't end up happening because we talked about how, you know, the, the, the proper way to approach puppets and then uh, maybe you, we might need, I don't know if we need to apologize to Amanda Marie, we just need to, make sure that she understands her uh, Miranda rights. True. Yeah. We'll speak at you next week. Hashtag Ear Biscuits. To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.